John Alzheimer is known as one of our nation's most recognized credit experts. Having worked for 28 years in the credit industry, John has become one of the most prolific speakers about credit and the go-to authority on answers to credit-related questions. Credit Countdown with John Alzheimer. Hi, my name is John Alzheimer and I am a consumer credit expert. And today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about some of the federal statutes, if you will, that govern how uh, certain components of the credit industry operate, primarily protect consumers, but also give rights or freedoms to companies that use credit report information, credit scoring information, and uh, attempt to collect debts from consumers. In my world, in the world of consumer credit, there are a number of, of federal laws that, that do these things. Two notable statutes, one is the Fair Credit Reporting Act or the FCRA. And the FCRA in my world is, is basically the Bible. It's 90 pages, it's been around since the very early 1970s and has been amended dozens of times to uh, include various protections for consumers. We'll talk about that in a moment. There's another federal statute called the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act or the FDCPA. And the FDCPA protects consumers from abusive practices of third party debt collectors or collection agencies. So we're gonna talk about that one as well. And finally, we're gonna talk a little bit about the CARD Act or the Credit Card Accountability, Responsibility and Disclosure Act of 2009. We're not gonna dive too deep into the CARD Act, but I am gonna talk a little bit about some of the protections afforded to you under the act. And then also some components of the CARD Act that I think have backfired. If you ask kind of a rhetorical question, about those acts, they're, they're all consumer protection statutes, meaning that they were designed to protect consumers from you know the big bad industry. But the question is, is do they help consumers reestablish credit? Do they help consumers better manage their credit? And if you dig into some of the fine print of the statutes, I think sometimes you're gonna answer no to that question, which is really kind of counterintuitive as to what the statute was designed for in the first place. So let's talk about the FCRA. The FCRA has tons of rights, and obviously we don't have the time to go through every single one of them. But some of the highlights, the right to free credit reports. And since 2003, there was an amendment to the FCRA in 2003 called FACTA, and FACTA amended the FCRA to allow for every US citizen to claim free copies of their credit reports once every 12 months. And so there are three primary credit reporting agencies that we all care about, Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, and we should all be claiming our credit reports from those three companies at least once every 12 months, if not more often. Some people would even argue, and I'm actually kind of in that camp, that the once every 12 month freebie, which may have made sense in 2003 when that particular part of the FCRA was amended. I'm not sure it makes a whole lot of sense in 2020 and beyond. I think consumers probably should have more access to their credit reports. There are other ways to get your credit reports, but only one every 12 months under federal law. The website where you can claim that those federal freebies is annualcreditreport.com. You're not gonna need a credit card because they're free. If you end up at a website that asks you for a credit card, you are in the wrong place. The other important component of the FCRA is the right for consumers to dispute information on their credit reports. If you believe that there is something on your credit reports that is incorrect, then you have the right to dispute it at no cost. When you dispute information, the credit reporting agencies and the companies that furnish the information what must perform what's called a reasonable investigation. That's right out of the statute. Many years ago, I was critical of this process. My stance regarding that process has evolved as the industry has evolved and some of the systems that are used in that dispute resolution process have improved and my stance is now, has now changed on that issue and I'm actually kind of supportive at this point. The dispute process has become much more consumer friendly and it is normally completed within a couple of weeks rather than the 30 days that the FCRA allows for. Consumers can now add supporting documentation and attachments to any disputes that they file online and the credit reporting agencies consider that information when they perform their investigation, can communicate that information to the furnishing parties when they send various dispute forms to them and they also, in many cases, will override responses from the companies that furnish information to them and correct or change information on a consumer's credit report to the consumer's benefit. So it really disproves this notion that the credit reporting agencies just simply pare it back 
what they're getting from data furnishers. There are many other protections afforded under the FCRA, things like permissible purpose. So in other words, permissible purpose essentially acts as the gatekeeper to the credit reporting information. It's not the wild, wild west. You actually have to have a legal reason to pull someone's credit report. So in other words, I can't just pull your credit report because I'm interested in it. That's, that would not be legal. However, a bank can pull your credit report if you apply for a loan. An employer can pull a credit report if you apply for a job. An insurance company can pull a credit report if you apply for insurance. Debt collectors can pull credit reports as part of their collection processes. So there are many scenarios. You can pull a copy of your own credit report when you want to see a copy every single year or periodically. So those are also some of the other rights is it allows access to certain parties but then restricts access to other parties. FDCPA. So the FDCPA, the reason I think the FDCPA is important is because if you believe the CFPB, then most of the disputes that are filed with the credit reporting agencies are related to collection accounts. And a collection account is simply an entry on a credit report that indicates that some creditor has outsourced a debt, usually that is in default, to this third party debt collection company for the purposes of collecting a debt. And so there are rules that are set by uh, the FDCPA with respect to how debt collectors have to operate. They cannot lie to you. They cannot be deceptive. They can't call you at all hours of the night. They cannot threaten to sue you unless they actually plan on suing you. They cannot disclose your debt to a third party. It's called third party disclosure. They can't, in other words, they can't call your boss at work and tell them, hey, John has a $10,000 defaulted credit card debt that he isn't paying. Do you really want to employ him? Can't do things like that. Any abusive debt collection practice is a no-no under the FDCPA. The CARD Act or the Credit Card Accountability Dis Responsibility and Disclosure Act of 2009. I'm gonna be straight up with you. I'm gonna get it on the record right now. I don't like the CARD Act. The CARD Act is a statute that among other things, makes it illegal for credit card issuers to grant credit to consumers who are under 21, unless they have a job or a cosigner. Keep in mind that that same exact consumer can get themselves into five or six figures of student loan debt at the same time, but they can't open a $300 credit card with a bank or a credit card issuer. In my mind, that just seems so hypocritical and, and completely out of whack. Plus, you're, you're an adult at 18. You can you know, be tried as an adult, you can join the military, you can vote. I don't like this idea of restricting access to credit cards for an additional three years. There are a lot of large credit card issuers that don't allow for co-signers any longer. So this co-signer exclusion to the under 21 restriction of the Card Act really isn't even an exclusion unless you want to limit your credit card options to the companies that actually still allow for co-signers. It also seems to suggest that someone who is under 21 you know, has an epiphany and wakes up one morning and decides that they're going to manage their credit properly. Obviously, that's not a reality. That's a theory. It's not tied to age. I know plenty of people who are in their 50s that manage their credit horribly. And I know plenty of people in their 20s that manage their credit perfectly. So it's not really tied to age. So anyway, that's the CARD Act. You can tell I'm not a, a huge fan of it. The good news after we've talked about the CARD Act, the FCRA and the FDCPA is that authorized users, which is likely why you're on this website watching this blog, is to learn about authorized users. The authorized user strategy still works. That's actually one way around all this silliness of the CARD Act is that you can still be added as an authorized user on someone else's credit card. Even if you're 18 years old, you don't have to have a job, you don't have to have a, an income or capacity to pay the, the balance of the credit card because you have no liability for the credit card as the authorized user. So I still like the authorized user strategy as an approach to not only build credit, but also to rebuild credit. So that's it from here. I really appreciate your time. I know there's a lot of videos on the internet about credit. You're choosing to spend some time with me today and I don't take that lightly. I absolutely appreciate it and I hope we get to see each other again soon. Thanks a lot. For more videos and credit tips from John Olsheimer, go to www.tradelinesupply.com.